Good morning, everyone. Rodney, thank you for the, the great introduction. I am thrilled to be in Australia. This is my first time here in this beautiful country, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here at the conference. Uh, I give a lot of presentations around the world. Uh, I was in India last summer, and I was invited by the country to share what Michigan is doing so well on social media that has won a lot of awards throughout the years. And when I tell people I'm from Michigan, I like to show them a map of where Michigan is. Michigan is easy to identify from outer space. It, uh, it's surrounded by four of the five Great Lakes, and that gives Michigan one of its nice natural assets. A lot of people like to kayak and swim and boat, and you're never six miles away from one of the lakes, either a Great Lake or, or a small inland lake. It looks kind of like a mitten, is, is how we affectionately refer to Michigan, kind of like a mitten from outer space. So when I tell people I'm from Michigan, I usually get one of two different reactions. The first reaction is an apology. People say, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I uh, think of Detroit. People read the headlines, they see that Detroit is bankrupt. And that's typically one of the first reactions I get is an apology. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, Hotel, the factories must be burnt down and, and nobody's living in Detroit. The second reaction I typically get is another apology. People say, brr, it must be cold in Michigan. There's the, the winter, there's three feet of snow all the time. And uh, I'm gonna play this little video here because this is typically what I think people's reaction of Michigan is, is like this news reporter in Traverse City. So we'll go ahead and play this clip. Another dangerous game kids play is to tunnel in snowbanks near the road. A few years ago, one boy... <laughs> and that, that really happened in, in Michigan in the winter. So our challenge, right, our challenge for uh, the state of Michigan is to shift perceptions away from Detroit not being a great place or the winter being uh, horrible, right? For the destinations in this room, regardless of the specific challenges we have, if we work for a large organization or a small organization, if we work for a city like Detroit, that's going through some hard times, or for working for a small town out in the country. Regardless of our destination, I think we all are facing the same two challenges nowadays. Two challenges I think we're all facing in this room. And the first is that people don't trust brands. People don't trust companies. If you're like me, or if you're like uh, you know, Hans from Innovation Norway, who's speaking uh, later in this conference, if you work for an, a government agency, people sure don't trust governments. I've read some research that people trust print advertisements. Only 25% of people trust print advertisements, only 25%. The numbers are less for online advertising. So just think about that for a minute. The other challenge we have is that as consumers, we are constantly bombarded by advertising. From the moment we wake up in the morning and we reach into you know, our pocket or we roll over bed and we check our Facebook status update and we see a, an ad for somebody, uh, or, and from the, the time we commute to work and we pass an outdoor billboard to the time we come home and we watch TV, we're constantly bombarded by over 3,000 marketing messages a day. Attention is at a deficit nowadays. 
Let me ask a question, and I want you all to be honest, and I'd like to see a show of hands. How many of us have ever gotten annoyed that somebody was calling us on our cell phone? Raise your hand if you've ever gotten annoyed that somebody was calling you on your phone. Now keep your hands up, and I want everyone to look around, okay? That's more than half of us in this room have gotten annoyed at the thought that another human being wanted to talk to us. That's ridiculous. Why, why is that? It's because we want things in our time and on our terms nowadays. So what, what do we do as social media practitioners in this conference, what, what do we do? People don't trust us and we're constantly bombarded by advertising. What do we do? The answer is simple. We turn to who people do trust. Who do people trust nowadays? They trust people like themselves, their, their friends and family. So for Michigan, what we do is, is simple. Our philosophical social media approach is that we make our fans the hero in everything we say and everything we share on social media. We make our fans the hero. So we empower people to become brand ambassadors and to share how great Michigan is with their friends and family. Think about it. It's one thing for me or for, for your organization to tell people how great your destination is, right? It's, it's one thing if the message comes from you, but it's something different if it comes from a friend that that person trusts, right? So we follow a rule, it's called the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the content we share, blog stories or photographs, 80% of the content we share comes from our fans and 20% comes from us. So how do we go about asking people to share their stories with us? Easy, right? We, we just ask people. We, at every touch point, we ask people, we invite them to share their stories with us. So on Facebook, here's a screenshot of what we invite people to do on Facebook. And on Instagram, it's the same thing. Uh, with our blog, we have a guest blogger program where we invite travelers as they're coming to Michigan for the first time or the 15th time to share their stories with us. On any given day, we're probably getting about 300 to 500 photographs a day submitted to us. That's a lot of photographs. And it's, it's actually remarkable. Who would have thought, you know, five years ago that we would, have had, we would have hundreds of people out there sightseeing across Michigan, taking photographs and then begging for a chance that, that we share them on their behalf. And you know what's great is we're not paying people to take these photographs, right? They're, they're out there sharing them on taking photographs on their own and, and uh, begging for a chance to, to share them with us. So we get 300 to 500 photographs a day, and that's simply too many photographs for us to share on a daily basis, right? So how do we choose which photographs to share? And the answer is simple. We align our social strategy to our business objective. Our brand for Pure Michigan, our brand is Michigan is majestic, mythic, and magical. That's our brand. So we're looking for those photographs that people take that reflect the brand. And those are the ones that we share. And take a look, behind me, these five photographs are pictures that I didn't take, my staff didn't take them, I didn't hire a photographer, I didn't pay any money. People, travelers, took these photographs, and they're gorgeous. So for the next 20 minutes, what I'd like to do is share some stories, some lessons that we've learned along the way that can be applied to your business. If you're working for a destination or maybe an advertising agency, if you work for a large organization uh, with maybe three social media practitioners, I wish, I <laughs> I, I wish we had three social media practitioners in my organization, or maybe you work for just an organization that's small, with just one. Maybe you're, you're kind of the jack of all trades. 
So here, I just want to share a few different stories with you guys. So Michigan is the most popular travel brand in the world on Instagram in terms of photographs being uploaded to the platform with the hashtag Pure Michigan. Australia ranks number one for most followers, and that's a remarkable feat. And we'll get to what it means to have a lot of followers in my next story. So, what we learned about Instagram surprised us. We routinely, on a daily basis, share photographs that fans have taken and hashtag Pure Michigan. And we invite people to use Pure Michigan at every platform, uh, everywhere. And we have the Pure Michigan name, which is our name, is consistent across every single platform. And that's key. Make it easy for people to find you and make it easy for people to share content with you every chance that you get. So what we found about Instagram surprised us. One, this is not too surprising, but one, people flock to photographs that are beautiful, sunsets, lighthouses, that type of stuff. That's the Pure Michigan brand. People flock to those types of photographs. We get a lot of likes and a lot of comments. But here's what surprised us the most, was that it's not just the type of photograph, it's who takes the photograph that's equally important, okay? So early on, we launched an Instagram influencer contest, a, a program. This was early on. At the time, we had about 10,000 followers. 10,000. It was a lot, but it's still a little, okay? We identified somebody that lived in Michigan. Uh, his name was Tony Detroit. He had 300,000 followers a lot more than what we did, and he loved Michigan. And the best thing is, he took amazing photographs, absolutely stunning photographs. He was an early, he got 300,000 followers because he was an early adopter of the platform. He was one of the first thousand people on Instagram. I kid you not, he met his future wife on Instagram. That's how much of an influencer he was. So, so we felt this guy, okay? And the challenge for us was, how do we get his attention, right? We're small. We only have 10,000 followers, and he's got 300,000. How do we get his attention? We wanted to get his attention because we wanted, uh, ultimately, to invite him to take photographs on our behalf. It was ultimately what we wanted to do. So we got his attention because we started liking his photographs. We started following him on Instagram. We started leaving comments. We be we became an active participant in the community. And that's a key message here, is people don't like advertising. What they like is real relationships with real people. My Barossa does a phenomenal job on this with Instagram and Twitter. Anne Marie is, is actively talking to real people, travelers, as they're vacationing on, the, on their holiday throughout My Barossa. And it's things like that that help humanize a brand, right? So we finally got this guy's attention on Instagram. And what we did was we invited him to become a guest photographer for Pure Michigan for an important event a NASCAR event. 75 million people watch NASCAR around the world. And this NASCAR event was happening in Michigan over the weekend. So we made an offer to him. We said, Tony, would you like to be the official pure Michigan photographer on Instagram for the weekend? We'll give you backstage access to the entire NASCAR event. You can talk to any race car driver. You can go inside the garages. You can talk to the mechanics. You can do anything you want. Just take good photographs. And he said yes to it. That was great. I was, frankly, I was nervous. I'll tell you why I was nervous. 
because I literally handed over the keys of our account to Tony Detroit. I gave him our login and password for the weekend. So it makes me nervous, right? What if Tony takes an unflattering photograph? What if he takes a selfie, right? And posts that to our account. What if he takes 15 photographs and posts that in a three minute period of time spamming our followers? This is, has a disaster written all over it, right? But it takes a little bit of risk to get a lot of reward. And for our business, we felt the benefits of partnering with Tony justified this risk. And here's what happened. He took amazing photographs. Within 20 minutes of Tony posting a photograph to our page, and by the way, he also took photographs of, on his own and posted him, and this is key, he posted photographs to his own account. So what happened was he was exposing our destination to his audience, his 300,000 audiences around the world. Within 20 minutes of him posting a photograph to his page, it would make it to Instagram's most popular page. And it would trend there for a period of time. We got thousands and thousands and thousands of new followers this way. And this is a model that we've been able to re replicate throughout the years. We laid down some ground rules, because I was a little bit nervous. And so we had kind of a, a gentleman's agreement between us. And here was just some general rules of thumb. We asked him to take, you know, three to 10 photographs, not a lot, not a little. And uh, we told him to post photographs and to use his name, sign his name at the end of every photograph that he would submit to our account. And uh, it, was, it was simple. We didn't want him to take uh, unsavory photographs, and we didn't want him to talk to our community as a pure Michigan brand. It was simple. <laughs> so the takeaway for this is, is to identify who your influencers are and create opportunities for them to share their stories with their friends and family on your behalf. A message is more trusted when it comes from somebody you know than some big brand or some advertiser or some government agency, right? I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what part of the body this is. I'm not even going to guess, but uh, I like it because uh, th this is the person tattoo themselves with, uh, with our brand. I don't know any other brand where people actually tattoo themselves, maybe Harley Davidson. So we're proud of this. Michigan ranks number one or number two on more social networks than any other state in America in terms of having the most number of followers. And that's something we're very proud of. I, I far too frequently get too much credit for that. Uh, I'm fortunate that I work with a great team and we have a good industry, tra you know, travel industry, good partners that we work with. And we have a small team. It's, it's, it's me and uh, two other people that have social media and their titles. We're not necessarily a large organization. But we don't measure the success of our social media efforts by this, by how many followers we have. We don't. We measure the success of what we do in social media by creating content that engages people that inspires them to share with their friends and family. And the content we choose to share aligns with our brand and it inspires people to dream someday, right, about visiting Michigan. My, tell me if this has ever happened to you, okay? My boss, this is about my second month on the job, so uh, I wanted to make a good impression because I was new on the job. And my boss walks into my office one day and she says, Chad, do you know what happened? Have you seen the news? I said, what? And she says, New York now has more fans than Michigan, is what she says to me. I was devastated because for years, 
Michigan was number one on, on Facebook, right, for, for years. And now New York surpassed us, and I was completely devastated. After picking my ego up off the floor, I went back to my computer, went to Facebook, and plugged it in. Here's what I saw. This is publicly accessible Facebook data insights. Anyone can go and, and see this data, right? What I found, uh, a few things. One, yes, indeed, New York had more followers. But more importantly, here's the other thing I saw. It was the average demographic, the average fan of New York was a teenager between the ages of 13 and 17 years of age. <laughs> they don't even have a driver's license in America. They can't even drive a car in America. So if New York's business objective is to get travelers, high school teenagers that don't even have a driver's license to hitchhike somehow and use their allowance money to travel to New York, then they're reaching the right audience. But if they're, trying to, if they're trying to get people that have disposable income, adults, to travel to New York, they're completely missing the mark, okay? The second thing that I noticed was that the engagement rate for New York was less than 1%. And that's calculated by taking a look at the people that are talking about the page divided by the total number of fans. The engagement rate was so low. Let's take a look at another state, okay? Just for comparison purposes only, let's take a look at another state. It'd be too easy if I showed you Michigan, because I, <laughs> I know we're doing a good job. Let's take a look at another state. How about Florida? So I went to Florida's Facebook page, and here's what I saw for Florida. Florida had fewer fans, but they were more engaged. And the average age, the average demographic of Florida's Facebook page was between the ages of 35 and 54. So these are adults. They can drive. They can get to Florida. And best of all, they live in another state. Okay? So the takeaway here is don't focus on trying to get more fans and more followers. It's a good first goal to begin with, but that's just a vanity number. It's meaningless if you're not reaching the right audience. It's quality not quantity that matters. Think about Facebook for a moment, right? One of the world's most popular platforms, over a billion people around the world use Facebook. Think about it. What are the three actions on Facebook that you can take? You can like, share, and comment. And, and, uh, and more or less in, in kind of that order of importance. Like, the action of liking something is the least amount of commitment that you can expect from somebody. It's like a digital high five. Like, ah, I like this comment, high five, pretty simple. A comment, think about that for a moment. A comment takes a little bit more thought. Somebody actually has to type out a sentence. A share, that's where the magic happens. Because a share means that somebody was so moved so inspired or so touched emotionally, they thought it was funny, they thought it was humorous, or just a great looking photograph, that they shared it with their friends and family. So focus on not getting more fans and more followers necessarily, but focus on creating engaging content that inspires people to share. A couple winters ago, we reacted quickly to a rather obscure tweet. And by reacting rather quickly to this obscure tweet, we generated $17 million in PR buzz around the world. Here's what we did. Tell me if this has ever happened to you. So this is any regular day Okay, in the middle of winter in Michigan, and I'm busy at work. I'm busy. Uh, we are promoting ice climbing and skiing and snowmobiling 
all the winter activities you would typically expect uh, a person in Michigan to do in the winter. So we're busy. I see a tweet come through my news stream, and I get about 200 to 500 tweets a day. That's a lot. I don't have time to pay attention to every single tweet, but this one here I paid attention to. Why? Here's a best practice, a universal best practice, is to know who your influencers are. Know who your biggest super fans are. And when they talk, listen. Listen to people. The Awesome Mitten is an influential travel blogger in Michigan. They're influential because they have a lot of followers, but more importantly, they have a high clout score. When the Awesome Mitten talks, their fans and followers engage with their content. So I saw this tweet come through. It said, I guess we should clarify. We think the only Awesome Mitten is Michigan. Kind of a cryptic tweet. I wasn't sure what it meant at the time. So I clicked on the link, and here's what I saw. It took me to a website, Wisconsin. My competition was using a mitten in their winter travel tourism. Remember I told you that us Michiganders, this is a culturally relevant thing for, for Michigan. All of us organizations have things that are culturally relevant to us, right? Michigan, we refer to ourselves as the mitten state because it looks like the mitten from the outer space. Well, this is what I saw. So I thought it was very interesting. And then uh, 11 different people retweeted uh, from the awesome mitten. Somebody says, what the hell kind of mitten is that? Somebody says. It was, it was funny. And then that day, towards the end of the evening, a small newspaper, one small newspaper published a story that said, Wisconsin's use of a mitten to promote winter tourism is a real stretch. Okay, so that's, that's what happened. Okay, so that's what happened. So the question is, so what do we do, if anything? And if we do something, why do we do it? Right, what, what do we do? Uh, let's just take a look here. So we had one tweet, okay, 11 retweets, and a small newspaper story. What was it? The sensible answer is, you know, we don't do anything. There's no story here. What is there to do? There's nothing to do. I am busy. My organization is busy promoting uh, snowmobiling and skiing and winter sports. If we did anything, this would be a distraction. Frankly, it would be off-brand. It would be off-message, right? It has nothing to do with our business. That's the sensible answer. But we decided to do something, and we decided to do something bold in a big way. We reacted quickly. We took a risk. We took a risk, and here's what we did. We launched a website called whoistherealmittenstate.com. And I kid you not, we have never launched a website quicker than we launched this website. We built it in four hours. And we're not some large organization. We're a rather small and nimble organization. We used WordPress for this. It was quick and easy to turn around. We, cr we created this in four hours, and we polled people in Michigan and Wisconsin. Who do you think? is the real mitten state. People loved it. People loved that we were an active participant in the conversation. People loved that a brand became part of the conversation. And we got an outpouring of user-generated content like this. If the hand don't fit, you must to quit. And we got more content like this. People were having fun with this. Finally, by the close of business, the same day that we launched the website, by the close of business, we got statewide news coverage. 
And then Wisconsin had a little bit of fun. At the time, just to give you some historical context, at the time, the National Football League, the, the, the football team for Wisconsin was undefeated. They won every single game. Michigan, our football team, we lost every single game. So Wisconsin posted this on Facebook. The colors are from their football team. They rubbed their mitten, their hands, in our face that they were undefeated. While all this was happening, we were having conversations with Wisconsin to make sure that we were having friendly debate, not menacing debate, right? What we did as a response of Wisconsin posting that Facebook message was we fired back to them. We took out some Google AdWords. This is only a couple hundred dollars, not a lot of money. We're not a big organization with, with unlimited budget like most of us here. We all have limited time, bandwidth, and resources. $200. If you were anywhere in the state of Michigan or Wisconsin or even in the U.S. and you went to Google and you typed in Michigan, Wisconsin, mitten debate, the great mitten war, or anything like that, you went to our website. You went to our website. Finally, it got picked up in national news. And I think the funniest story ever of the 300 stories around the world that were published was written by Gawker that says the dumbest war ever erupts online. States fighting over which one looks most like a mitten. There becomes a point in time when the chatter starts to die down with these types of things, the, the real-time content marketing chatter starts to die down. And uh, it was about a week later, chatter started to die down. So, end of story, great, right? We had a little bit of fun along the way, and we drew attention to Michigan during a time of the year when tourism is not too popular during the winter. So what do we do? story starts to wind down. The sensible answer is you just move on. You get back to doing what I was doing last week, which is promoting snowmobiling and, and snowshoeing. Well, that's the sensible answer, but we decided to take a risk and to do something big. So we did one more thing, and here's what we did. We got a lot of stories because we did the second thing. We created a charity drive, a mitten charity drive, and we asked people in Michigan and Wisconsin to donate mittens to their uh, local charity. That drove a lot more conversations uh, as well. People loved this type of PR move. And then finally, it broke international news. One rather obscure tweet. We get 500 tweets a day. One tweet, we reacted quickly by launching this website and becoming part of the conversation, joining the conversation, that generated $17 million in PR buzz around the world. So the takeaway here is to use real-time content marketing, right, to be relevant, to, to resonate with audiences. Um, the, the, the American, uh, the Super Bowl uh, did this a year later when the Super Bowl lights went dark did you guys watch the Super Bowl here? The lights went dark, and Oreo, in 15 minutes, posted a Facebook uh, photograph that said, power out, no problem. It got 15,000 retweets, 8,000 new Twitter followers, and Ad Age said, Ad Age magazine said, Oreo's dunk in the dark, real-time content Facebook post was one of the top five advertisements the entire Super Bowl. And how much did it cost them? Nothing to do this, other than being smart and being quick. So uh, three, three takeaways. The first takeaway is identify who your influencers are, create programs where they can share your content. Second takeaway, it's quality, not quantity of followers. Don't focus on chasing more people focus on creating the type of engaging content that inspires people to want to share and eventually visit. And then third, remember social media is about being social. Have real conversations with real people. 
It's a good tip to plan out a content calendar 30 days in advance. It's an approach we follow. We create a calendar 30 days in advance of what we're going to say, where we're going to say it, and how, which social network. It's a content calendar. It's work, but it saves a ton of time. But don't set it in stone. You have to have the, you have to be present when people are talking so you can be part of the conversation. 